From his home in Walpole, New Hampshire, filmmaker and producer Ken Burns discusses making the Civil War. Here now is media critic and host Ron Powers. We live in a time when even the Vietnam War is ancient history to many Americans. What is it about this war fought nearly 130 years ago that compels you so deeply? I try to think about the history of the United States as one would the history of an individual. The Civil War is the great traumatic event in childhood that changed who we are. We might be submerging it, uh, avoiding it, wrapping it at myth at some times, but it can't help but bubble up to the surface. And I think today, despite our amnesia over Vietnam and almost everything else historical, the Civil War absolutely demands our attention because so much of how we were uh, and are are contained in those four years. Uh, Shelby Foote at the beginning of this evening, this is the defining event in our nation, the crossroads of our being. Um, I agree completely. You've chosen a visual format that's almost unthinkable in this age of MTV images, fast edits, still photographs, uh, portraits, maps, drawings. What gave you the conviction that you could bring the Civil War to life this way? Well, I don't understand where this uh, sense got that, that using old photographs was a problem. My mission is to make the past come alive. In a way, I'd prefer to have an old photograph. It gives me much more latitude. If you endow this old photograph with the belief that it once lived and add a complex sound effects track, you can at times serve the past better than any other way that I know and make that old photograph come alive. I actually felt that having no newsreels was an asset to this. It allowed a fresh canvas, if you were, to go back and not change the Civil War, but to repaint it in a way that spoke to the truths and not to the myths of it. And e everything that we've seen in newsreel and motion picture about the Civil War, I think, has lied. In what way? Well, uh, we've allowed Birth of a Nation and Scarlet and Rhett to define our image of the Civil War. And I think particularly tonight, in the first episode, what we were trying so hard to do was try to dispel some of those myths, to sort of hold them, that the South was not monolithic, the North was not monolithic. There were people in the South that, that, uh, that had sympathies for the North and vice versa. But more important, that blacks were not passive bystanders to this story. They, were not, they did not prefer to remain in a plantation environment. They were not content. Uh, to see the action go on around them. And that, as Birth of a Nation suggests, they were not these dark and sinister figures that were corrupt and somehow uh, unequal to the liberation that was bestowed on them by this great sacrifice. Nothing could be further from the truth. So these photographic images allow us to linger for a moment and sort of invest our own narrative imagination in them. Exactly. And there's a really good example tonight. We saw the Agassiz photographs. Uh, Louis Agassiz is a Harvard professor who photographed blacks in these just incredible poses. His attempt to prove the inferiority of the black race and yet the nobility of these human yes. beings come out and render his argument so absolutely ludicrous as, as, as to serve our own purposes now. And if anything, we come with only one bias in this film. We have no enemies except the institution of slavery. Right. And I'm very pleased to have that, and I freely admit that bias in advance. Right. This first segment has given us a kind of overture of the great personalities who will emerge in this series and who will carry us through the yes. narrative of the war. My instinct is that as you dealt with these figures from history, as you watched their faces and arranged that great sequence of photographs, you became very deeply involved in the reality of these people. Will you tell me about that? It, that's very true. I feel like I know Stonewall Jackson and Nathan Bedford Forrest, that I've come to love Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and Grant and of course Lincoln and Lee continue to really occupy me. They, they and their lives and their works and their missions are sustaining even today. Um, when we think of history, it very often configures as something dry 
boring, a kind of nutritional but, but sort of unappetizing meal. Uh, that's because we think that history reduces to dry facts and dates. I think history reduces to people that the word history is mostly the word story. And if you tell stories about people, if you use these lives as the building blocks, and the glue that connects these building blocks is the emotional byproduct of the friction that these lives created, and certainly there is a great deal of friction in this civil war, uh, we can't help but understand that history is our greatest teacher, that not only is it nutritional, I admit that, uh, but it, it tastes good too. Right. But you haven't chosen to tell this history only from the vantage point of the generals and the statesmen and the presidents. Your, your lens, as it were, zooms back and forth between those upper echelons and the ordinary people, the foot soldiers. What's the function of that interplay? Somehow television is one of the chief culprits in our national amnesia, but I've discovered this wonderful ability that it has. We need to teach our history, not just from the generals and the presidents, from the top down. We need to tell it from the bottom up, the ordinary foot soldiers, to be, if you will, a kind of Homeric mode. That is, that we sing the stories of the great struggles, not only from the gods in the pantheon, but from the spear carriers. And so we've chosen to follow among dozens of soldiers, Elisha Hunt Rhodes from the second Rhode Island and Sam Watkins from Columbia, Tennessee, one from the north, one from the south. They and their brothers and their sisters, black and white, give the story its real meaning. And I think that Homeric de depth and, and wonders of all wonders, this medium that we struggle to contain its baser instincts can deliver that as, as well as anything I've found. I mean, it's a great secret weapon in this age of limited attention that, that television does have this wonderful aspect to it. There's something about seeing a blurred photograph of Abraham Lincoln in the background of a group of people that makes him seem almost to come to life in a way that the rapid fire, constant motion of an MTV image can never do. That's right. I think we receive images in a sequence of impressions. The first one, we read it for its information, and then MTV would have you cut. This happens within a millisecond. And then you're gone. But if you stay with something, and then stay again, and stay again, you're deepened. Abraham Lincoln leaves Springfield, Illinois, uh, to head for an uncertain future, and the White House, and he speaks from the steps of his home. My goodness, uh, to have been there, to have yeah. felt that. And if we stay with that, we create that scene. We trust that to have that inanimate photograph to have once been a representation of, of a real event. I wish to extend the belief that that real event occurred. I know where you found the images in the archives of Abraham Lincoln, Robert E. Lee. How does an Elijah Hunt Rhodes come into your crosshairs? Where do you find these men, these foot soldiers? Elisha is one of the great gifts to this production. Uh, there is a fellow townsman here in Walpole, New Hampshire, who published his great-grandfather's diary. His great-grandfather, Elisha Hunt Rhodes, enlisted with the 2nd Rhode Island in, early in the war and fought uh, throughout. I bought this diary out of obligation to my friend and discovered to my great delight that this was a magnificent record of the war, spoken from an ordinary soldier. I shared it with some of the distinguished consultants that we had advising us, and they were flabbergasted. There are literally hundreds of Union narratives and memoirs and diaries, and this one seemed to be the best, the freshest of them all. And we were able to find an actor who had a Rhode Island accent, and Bob Rhodes, the great-grandson, had I think three or four dozen old photographs from the moment he signed up, as well as pictures of his mother, all the way through to the last reunion he ever attended. And uh, Elisha becomes, in a way, as important to this history as Abraham Lincoln. In an important way, he, he anchors this film for all the rest of us who aspire to Lincolnhood, but we'll never get there. So he, along with Sam Watkins, the Southerner, becomes our companion and our guide down at the dirt level of this war. Sam's a really remarkable um, figure, and I think in the case of our production, made more remarkable by Charlie McDowell's extraordinary reading of his memoir. Sam sat down uh, 20 years after the war and wrote this memoir 
uh, full of all the things that hindsight provides and uh, his good humor. And that informs it. But to have this ongoing diary where we see really the maturation in subsequent episodes of Elisha Hunt Rhodes, he's really struggling with trying to understand what death means. Death at home is one thing. Death on the road in battle is still another. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I worship Elisha for the access to that fresh encounter with this horrendous cataclysm, as Shelby says, the great family drama that this is. Shelby Foote being the as close as we come in the series to having a consistent narrator. Tell me about Shelby. Well, David McCullough narrates our narrative, written by Jeffrey C. Ward and my brother, Rick. And it's, he does a magnificent job, but that job is to be <clears throat> invisible, our guide. And it's a northern voice, too. Shelby Foote is a southern novelist who took 20 years off of his life to write the definitive three-volume narrative history of the war. It's a magnificent, magnificent achievement. And we interviewed Shelby, and we noticed very quickly that he seemed to make the war come alive. He was speaking not so much in the past tense, but in the present. And so we quite consciously made a decision to run the sound effects of the battle that we happened to be in under his um, sequences. And it's magnificent. Shelby makes the war come alive. He has the, the novelist's sense of story and narrative, but the, the historian's rigorous insistence on accuracy uh, and, and helped us understand. He said something to me at the end of the production that was really a description of what we'd been trying to do under his advice throughout. He said, God is the greatest dramatist. That if we learned to just tell the story of the Civil War, all the questions of balance, all the questions of analysis, all the other concerns will come through. We don't have to superimpose anything like that, change the chronologies or what have you, and, and it worked out beautifully. So Shelby's voice, that melodic, musical, <clears throat> lovely voice, sort of becomes the voice of the war itself. I'd like for you to tell me a little bit about the exactitude that you bring to your choice of voices in, <clears throat> in this series. It's very important to you, isn't it? It is. Um, there's at first an emotional level. I want to get an Abraham Lincoln um, that is Lincoln, that can be Lincoln. I use the term inhabit the words when I work with these extraordinary men and women, actors and men and women of arts and letters. I want them to inhabit the words that were spoken and to help to make this past come alive. And I think they do that remarkably. Uh, you take poetic license in this uh, process. William Tecumseh Sherman, an Ohioan, is read by Brooklyn-born Arthur Miller. The playwright. And, the playwright. And yet, you can't now imagine <coughs> hearing <laughs> William Tecumseh Sherman without yes. hearing Arthur mm -hmm. Miller doing it. He's just perfect. He's gruff, he's bluff, he's, he's, he's exactly the intelligence that I'm sure Sherman had. You assembled um, an enormous gallery of, of rather well-known actors and actresses yes. to do these voices, and, and most of them uh, seem content to, to disappear into the character. Their names uh, are not really prominent in this series. How, how, did you, how did you woo them into this kind of project? First of all, we're not the biggest blip on their radar screen. They very kindly tolerate our persistent and, I hope, not obnoxious request to give us an hour or so of their time, and they do so. They bring not only that kindness, but their talents to this moment of reading a grant in the case of Jason Robards or uh, Julie Harris's reading of yes. Mary Chestnut, which is extraordinary. The diarist. Morgan Freeman's extraordinary Frederick Douglass readings. All of these things, they bring a sense of contributing to the whole. And they do disappear into these characters. And because it's not a feature film, it's not in the mainstream of what they normally do, there is a selflessness that serves our purposes, and I believe ultimately theirs. I believe that, that Morgan Freeman's performance of Frederick Douglass is as good as his Miss Daisy performance, yes. as good as his role in Glory. It's just a minor uh, nugget, one bite, compared to the entire scope of his work. But no less important and no less affecting. And that's a great service to us. Are we going to be hearing Vermont voices as well? 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Edward Hastings Ripley is one of the great mm -hmm. voices. Uh, Garrison Keillor is actually the, the voice uh, most often of Edward Hastings Ripley. Ripley being uh, he's a, a commander. A commander of a Vermont regiment. A Ripton, a Rutland regiment. A Rutland yes, regiment. Yes. And, and he's, um, oh, he's magnificent. And just before Antietam, he has the most extraordinary observation as he watches the assembly of these two magnificent armies that are about to maul each other to pieces in what will be the bloodiest day in American history. Uh, and, and still staggering to me, after all this work, after five and a half years, to watch these men, and I think of them as small, going into battle in cornfields, and then hearing that the casualties on the Union side are twice as great as the casualties on D-Day. And I think of D-Day with those massive ships and the uh, attacks on yes. the beaches, and here in a cornfield in Maryland, in this beautiful, exquisite country, in this exquisite time, under this cloud of slavery, we murdered more of ourselves than in all these other days uh, in the great epic battles of the world. And what kind of accounting does Ripley take of this? He, it, you know what I'm struck all the time is by the poetic eloquence of these ordinary people. These were literate wrote, people. Oh, it, it is extraordinary. They're poets, all of them, and that adds to the Homeric possibilities yes. here. Uh, he just observed the ghost-like uh, figures of the men and the sounds of the hoofbeats on the bridge as they went over and and he and he says about the memory not being erased from his all of this stuff mm -hmm. is just extraordinary mm -hmm. you know and it counterpoints with some of the good humor that comes from yes. other observations yes. made by Vermonters and others one of the most touching voices to emerge from this episode occurs at the end Sullivan Ballou the letter writer what does his letter signify I think Sullivan Ballou contains for me the whole of the war. Sullivan Ballou's letter, uh, written before the Battle of Bull Run, we save to well after the entire Bull Run affair is over, indeed the last moment of our first episode. It seems to contain multitudes. It is at once a love letter, is it at once a fearful man, but also a brave man, a man strongly tied to country and history, a man strongly tied to family and love, to the current situation, to the past, to the future, to his children. Uh, it, it's, I think, the most beautiful letter I've ever read. Uh, it's read magnificently by Paul Roebling, uh, who's read a number of voices in this film. Uh, in, this, in this episode, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes and William Lloyd Garrison and many others. But here in Sullivan Ballou, the interpretation is so amazing. I've carried around the letter in my pocket for, for the last several years. Uh, uh, one of our consultants sent it to us, and we knew the instant we read it that this suggests not only the country that we had been up to that moment, but the country we were going to have to become. And he therefore is poised there to take us from the past, which is episode one, to the future which is the rest of this series and beyond in the United States. The war is changing. Its cost is increasing. The battles are taking a terrible, terrible toll. Um, Bull Run, which was just blew everyone's minds in terms of the scope, now looks like a skirmish by 1862. We will see the bloodiest day of the war and then the brightest, I'm pleased to say. The issue of emancipation, which the politicians, Lincoln included, have been trying to shove aside, forces itself to the front and exerts the inevitable moral pressure that it will bring to change this war into something higher. Um, that's good news. Unfortunately, that news brings um, terrible news for mothers and sisters and wives.